Welcome to Taj Talks. This is going to be a different episode or, or style of Taj Talks because, as you know, I usually talk about books. And I am going to talk about a book, but I'm going to talk about a book that's very, very, very personal to me. And that book is a book I wrote, which is called Sparks Tastic 21 Nights with Sparks in London. And this is the book, the book cover. As you can see, the flap opens this way, a little like a pin-up poster. And it's a painting actually done by my wife, uh, Luna Menno. And about five years ago, I went to London to see my favorite, well, not my favorite, sort of this band I'm uh, obsessed with by the name of Sparks, which is basically two guys, a pair of brother, uh, brothers, two brothers. One is Russell Mel and the other is Ron Mel. They've been together for, oh gosh, like 40-something years now. And I first discovered Sparks in the year 1974. And um, that album that sort of turned my whole life around for whatever reasons, and I actually write about it in this book, I have many reasons why I love this album, is Kimono My House, put out by Island Records in the UK and eventually came out in the US, I think a couple of months after that release. And uh, Come On To My House was one of those records that I was attracted to because the album cover. There was two Japanese women, or I presume they're Japanese because they're wearing kimonos, making funny expressions on their face. There was no lettering on the front album. It was just basically this sort of lime green background with these two kimono-clad Japanese women. I was intrigued for whatever reasons. Uh, when I turned the cover around, you had these little capsule images of the musicians in Sparks. But there's one big picture, which was a picture of Ron Mel and Russell Mel together. And what struck me was the juxtaposition of two styles of these, two, these guys. One was Russell Mel as sort of this pop star looking guy circling 1974, but a little bit smarter than the average looking pop star of that time, in my opinion. And then on the other hand, we had Ron Mel, who had his hair slicked back, had a little Toothcomb mustache, which either depends how you look at it, either looked like Charlie Chaplin or Adolf Hitler. And uh, the combination of having a Chaplin Hitler character match with a pop star looking guy was a really, really strange and odd and, and, and actually kind of disturbing image for me. So, therefore, of course, being disturbed by this image, I bought the album. And when I came, when I went home and I played the first cut, this town ain't big enough for both of us, I felt my whole life was transformed, this change, everything changed. This degalloping rhythm of the song, the lyrics, which I couldn't even gather, but it seemed kind of intelligent, even though Russell's vocals were going 100,000 miles per second, it seems to me at the time. It's just, I never heard anything like that before. And also, it struck me as something being totally new and modern, and I never heard it before. So it sounded very very 1974, whatever that means. And the only other records that sounded really modern to me at the time, or a little bit before, was the uh, first Roxy Music album. And basically, Come On To My House Sparks. Those two albums really struck me that I live in the modern times, and this is actually new, and there was nothing happened before this, and I'm sort of starting from ground zero of sorts. And um, this has stayed with me, this, this feeling for that, one, that, that particular album for, well, to this day, over like, I don't know, 40 years now. And um, eventually, um, many years later, in uh, 2008, Sparks did a series of shows in London where uh, uh, they did 21 shows in 21 nights, where each night is devoted to one album from beginning to end. And as you know now, it's not that unusual for a band to um, do, do their big hit album from beginning to end. It's very common, in fact, especially for a band or an artist that's been around for many, many years. <coughs> but Sparks did every album in their catalog from beginning to end, from the first album to their 20th album, and even albums of theirs that were not that popular, that didn't sell at all, still they had a show for that particular album from beginning to end. <coughs> and what's amazing, <coughs> when I went to the show, was, was was how very much alike it was the recording. They pretty much reproduced the recording, I would say exactly, because there's always that live aspect that never goes away. But 
it was kind of amazing how close to the arrangements they stayed with the album. So anyway, uh, before the shows, obviously, I decided to go to London maybe to see one of the shows. Because I, I didn't have any money at the time. And I thought, this would be crazy, but I'm going to go to London and at least see one of the shows. And then I thought, well, wait, if I'm going to go to London and see like, the first show, I should at least stay for the second show. Makes perfect sense. So I went to bed that night thinking, okay, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay for like two or three nights and, you know, and see two of the shows. And then in the middle of the night, I woke up in the middle of the night and I just thought, no, I have to see every show. And not only, uh, not only am I going to see every show, I'm going to write a book about it or about my experiences of going to see these shows and, and living through these shows. So, you know, I booked a ticket to uh, London. Uh, first I went to Paris, I wrote about Paris in the book, and then I went to London to see 21 shows of, uh, by Sparks. And um, I have to, you have to keep in mind, this is not a biography of the band. What it is, is basically my experiences going to see the shows and how I see the shows, and how those shows read to me. But it's also about London, and a little bit about Paris as well, because I feel like London is very much of a character in itself. And London is also very much part of uh, the Sparks story, if you look at the Sparks history, because they first made it big internationally, or big, the first hit song, was from the UK, and it seems to this day the UK is very, has a very warm reception or a warm um, relationship with Sparks. And um, so I went to London and it was quite remarkable. I mean, first of all, I learned about parts of London that, that I, I really didn't know about too much before. I've been to London maybe five or six times before this trip. But this is the first time I ever spent like, a great deal of time in Islington, London, which is North London, and I became really fascinated by that whole part of London. I, I, I fell in love with the history of the place, I fell in love with the um, architecture of the place of sorts. I love the people there. At the time it was very multicultural, it still is, of course. And um, where Sparks played in Islington is this sort of this weird strip mall that's kind of ugly, in my opinion, called N1. And so this, ju this, this juxtaposition of this sort of strange strip mall in the middle of this place that has so much history was kind of amazing to me. And um, what I was struck by while I was writing the book, um, I researched um, uh, some people from the silent movie era, like Charlie Chaplin, because of the Chaplin mustache. And, and when you compare it to Ron Mel's mustache during the Kimono My House time. And I was like really surprised at the same time, you know, where, where Sparks were playing uh, 50 years before that, or 60 years before that, uh, Troy Chaplin, or 70 years, come to think of it, Troy Chaplin was doing his own show before he went to America, just around the corner from the theater where Sparks were playing. And this may not seem to be such a ha-ha moment or anything to me, but it, sh it, it exposed a certain tradition of that place of Islington. And I feel very much that Sparks is pretty much in the tradition of Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd. I feel they come from not only from a music background, but also from a cinematic background. And when you think of Sparks in a cinema sense, I'm thinking of people like uh, of, uh, not only the great silent clowns, but also people like Orson Welles and, of course, Jacques Tati, where at one time Sparks was going to make a movie with Tati. Uh, it didn't happen due to either finances of making a movie or Tati's uh, poor health at the time. But nevertheless, I committed myself to write this book. I went to every show, every 21 shows. And uh, I started having this pattern, like a work pattern, almost like working in a factory where I wake up in the morning in London, I wrote what happened the previous night before. Uh, I, I pretty much leave the house around 3 o'clock, get to have like an early dinner before the show. The show starts around 6, 6.30. And I just wrote about my experiences of going to the show, but also about me going to the show, well, being at the show, but also going to the show. And... Um, I was struck by the Sparks, Ronald Russell's um, um, uh, vision of doing these shows because to me it worked as a conceptual piece of work. It's like a conceptual art of sorts where they're going to do a complete, sh they're all their, every song, I think they did like 250 songs or 230 songs. Um, and I was just overwhelmed by the fact that they did everything in order. And it's kind of amazing to go to a show, if you're a fan of Sparks, you know exactly what's going to happen. 
except for the encore. You're not sure what the encore is, but uh, usually they did a song from that era or a B-side to one of the sing singles that came off the album. And um, it was just a powerful statement to me, also an emotional thing for me to be here. It was almost like um, for a, a, a privilege where you go to the Vatican if you're a Catholic, or you go into Israel to touch the Welling Wall, or you're going to Hamburg because that's where the Beatles played in the club. And, 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 and this is sort of similar type of feelings I had going to London to see Sparks. And um, I had to get down on, a, on, a, on paper, my experiences. I didn't want to photograph it. I didn't want it to shoot films. I didn't want to record anything. Nor did I want to do interviews for, with it. Because um, I, had, I had the option of interviewing the band uh, and people around the shows. But I really, I wanted to make it totally a first-person observation of going to London to see these shows. And um, again, I was... Uh, I was in this weird emotional state where I'm commenting on, on, on the shows itself, but also London played a huge role in, in, in the book and on me as well, and uh, as well as being separated from Los Angeles, where I live and where I'm doing the show right now. So uh, it was sort of a mixture of being slightly jet lagged, being culture shocked, and also just being um, feeling this great privilege of being in the premise, in, 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 the, in the theater, the sea sparks. And um, for most people who have seen the shows, all 21 shows, or just some pe people have saw at least two or three or several, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite an experience to go through. And um, anyway, so this book is called Sparks-tastic. If you're interested, do read it. And again, it's not a band biography, but it's more of a memoir or autobiography about my experiences of being a Sparks fan and going seeing the ultimate show with Sparks. Take care. Bye-bye. Tosh Talks.